Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I said God has always got a plan. He's always got a plan. And just because you or I don't know what the plan is, that doesn't mean that God doesn't know what it is. I'm going to read a little list here of things that we may have to press through. Rejection. Betrayal. Abandonment, unforgiveness, offense, self-pity, wanting to take revenge, <laughs> hard times and trials, trouble you don't feel like you deserve, self-centeredness, Jealousy, the desire to give up, discouragement, disappointment with people, disappointment with God, and people pleasing. How many of you had more than three? <laughs> okay, I got a confession. I looked at the list and I had 15 out of 16. <laughs> That doesn't mean I have, I have them all now. Thank God I've gotten through some of them. But every single one of those things I've had to majorly confront in my life and not let them take me out. Now I know you want to know which one I didn't have. <laughs> and you won't be able to sleep good tonight if I don't tell you so. The only one of these I did not have was disappointment with God. I don't know why, but for some reason, I never blamed God for any of my problems. And I'm glad that I didn't, because I didn't have too many friends that I really needed Him. You know, some people, the first thing they do when things don't go right is they get mad at God. God is not causing our problems. He is the answer to our problems. What I really want to get across to you tonight is it's time to press into a new beginning. And some of you need a new beginning right now. How many of you need a new beginning right now? Okay. Well, gee, that's the whole crowd. I don't, need, I don't even have to say the other thing I was going to say. You know, you may need a new beginning in uh, getting out of debt. Maybe you've tried before and it's just a problem for you. You just keep spending money you really shouldn't be spending. Maybe you need to a new beginning with a bad attitude. You have a bad attitude. No? Nobody here with a bad attitude? Okay. <laughs> I'll try something else. Um, maybe you need, maybe you're the one that needs to forgive somebody. Maybe. <laughs> If not, you could try to buy this teaching for somebody else. Maybe you need a new beginning in eating better. <laughs> People look at me and say, how can at your age, how can you be in that good a shape and be so little? Well, I don't eat everything I want and I work out three days a week, and for a long time I walked five miles a day until I started having trouble with my feet, and I can't do that anymore, so I'll just find some other way to get the devil. Amen? I got, yeah, well, you don't even know what I got. I got plantar fasciitis, and then I got that taken care of, and then I got some kind of tendonitis. You know, there's just stuff all over your body, and it, it all wants to get some kind of an itis. I mean, there's so many itises, it's not even funny. <laughs> Colonitis and bursitis. And... Anyway. <laughs> we all need new beginnings all the time. You know, we get started and we're going good for a while. Maybe you need a new beginning in your prayer life. Maybe you need a new beginning in Bible study. Maybe you need a new beginning in regular giving. 
I, I, I don't know how this message couldn't be for everybody in some way, shape, or form. Okay, Paul said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3, 10 through 14, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So the apostle Paul is telling us right there that if we will want to become like Jesus, we're going to have to share some of his sufferings. <laughs> and that's not a curse word, it's a Bible word. <laughs> that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or am already made perfect, but I, what? <laughs> Press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. In essence, he's saying, if I think about what Jesus did for me, what he went through for me, come on. then I am determined that I am going to press through whatever I have to press through and be the person that Jesus died for me to be. Amen. Amen? Brothers, I don't consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do. What a statement. One thing I do. It is my one aspiration. It is the most important thing to me. Letting go of what lies behind. And straining, see it? Straining forward to what lies ahead. Now, I don't know if this is a happy message right now tonight or not. But I do know this. The people who come to hear me teach, I am not going to feed you dessert every time you come. I'm sorry, but I'm just not. God loves you, you're sweet, you got a great future. <laughs> There's a miracle right around the corner for you. Oh, I could turn it on, man. I could get you up on your feet screaming and yelling, and I could go out of here feeling like so on top of the world. But I've got a job to do. And I'm going to be accountable to God for doing it. And I believe that the job that God has given me is to help his people mature. Amen. Amen. We love to see people get saved. But I don't want to see you get saved and then just be a carnal believer all your life. I mean, Christians should be happy. We, pe we, we should be infectious. People should just want what we've got. They should want to just be around us. There needs to be something different about us. We're not supposed to be like everybody else and be like the world. We're anointed for hard stuff. Did you hear me? We are anointed for hard things. We don't need... We don't need to glide into everything in life. A challenge really should just make us go, all right, bring it on. Come on. You know, we'll feel much better about ourselves if we, if we get a little stirred up and press through things and just this lazy me. <laughs> Isaiah 61 in verse 3 says that God gives us the oil of gladness for mourning and the garment of praise instead of a faint or a heavy spirit. Jesus wants us to have, now I yellowed this in, so this is important. <laughs> Jesus wants us to have a present expectation of something positive instead of constantly mourning over what we've lost. You can find something to mourn over daily if you want to. It's not that difficult. All you got to do is sit 
sit around and remember all the bad things that have happened to you in your life and forget all the good. You know, everybody in here, you've had more good things happen to you than bad. Everybody, you've had more good things happen to you than bad. We talk about hope, and I was amazed to find out when I really did a thorough study on hope, that hope is not just, well, I, I hope, you know, I hope so. No, Bible hope, and Peter says we've been born again into an ever-living hope, so guess what? You, you, hope is something you can always have. No matter what kind of problem or circumstance you got, you can always have hope. But it's not just, well, I kind of wish God would do something. No, hope is a positive expectation that something good is going to happen to you at any moment. What happens if you start getting up with that expectation? I can't wait to see what God does today. Boy, I bet today is going to be good. All things are possible with God. There's no telling what he may do for me because he loves me. Not get up and the first thing the devil does is remind you of everything you've ever done wrong in your life. <laughs> Won't even hardly pray and ask God for anything because you've been so bad. Well, so is everybody else. Look at the possibilities the future holds instead of the past with all of its disappointments. Now, Jesus said he came to give us joy. <laughs> the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. We have an enemy, the devil. We need to start knowing who our real enemy is. Your battles belong to God, but that doesn't mean that he's going to do everything for you. People get so excited when you preach out of, out of those scriptures and chronicles that talk about how the battle belongs to God. You'll not need to fight in this battle. You won't see this enemy anymore. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we just, people just get wild, just wild. But you know what? There's always going to be something that God is going to tell you to do. He told Jehoshaphat, go and take your place. <laughs> and his place was actually a place of worship. And so sometimes if you've got problems, instead of telling everybody about them, you need to just worship. Yeah. Just worship till you get a breakthrough. Mourning is defined as to feel grief or sorrow, to feel sad over something that did or did not happen. Jesus said, the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. But I came that you might have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. I want to be a happy Christian. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, I found this very interesting. In the Old Covenant, God put a limit on how long people could mourn when someone died. In Deuteronomy 34, 7 and 8, it says, Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was undimmed and his vigor unabated. So he was still strong, still going. He didn't have to wear glasses, I guess. His eyes were undimmed. <laughs> I'll tell you. I was trying to look at a menu in the car today to the restaurant where we're going to. And I sat there and pretended like I could see it for five minutes. <laughs> I mean, I kept trying every which way to see it. And I finally thought, why don't I just get out my glasses? I know I can't see without them. <laughs> without them or contacts, one of the two, so. When your arms are no longer long enough, <laughs> that's when you got to get the glasses. But his eye was undimmed and he was still strong. And the people of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. Then the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. 
Now, you got to realize how important Moses was to these people. He did their praying. He, he did their confessing. I mean, when they would act like just ridiculous little kids, God would pray, pray through and, I mean, Moses would pray through and get God to continue blessing them. And he led them out of Egypt and through the wilderness and through the Red Sea. And so even though they grumbled and complained about Moses all the time, I'm sure they also loved him and really depended on him. And now he had died. And so they didn't know what, what, what. They weren't in the promised land yet. I just thought about today. I wonder, wonder what they thought. Well, I guess we'll never make it now. <laughs> but see, here's the good thing. God is never without a plan. <laughs> and they didn't know yet what God's plan was, but he already planned to have Joshua take them in to the promised land. I said, God has always got a plan. He's always got a plan. And just because you or I don't know what the plan is, that doesn't mean that God doesn't know what it is. Yeah, woo! I heard one person shout back there, so I'm gonna shout with you. They had mourned him 30 days and the time of mourning was over. Now, I'm not trying to be ridiculous if you've lost somebody that you love. I'm not saying that you got to get over it in 30 days. But there's a principle here that there's a time for grieving and mourning and then there's a time to go on with life. And that doesn't mean that you ever forget or that you ever stop missing the person, but it does mean if you're alive and breathing, then God has still got a purpose for you. Come on. And then, which I think is very interesting, God reminded Joshua that Moses was dead. <laughs> well, he had to know that he'd been mourning him for 30 days. Joshua 1, 1 and 2, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses is dead. <laughs> now, it wasn't like he was telling him something he didn't know. So what's God up to here? He's making a point. And here's the point that he's making. Moses is dead now, therefore, you arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. So he's saying, okay, that part of your life is over. Is anybody home? Yeah. That part of your life is over. It's time now to get up and get going again. Come on. Whatever it is. My husband walked out on me. A woman told me the other day, she said, my husband cheated on me with my best friend. And she said, I thought it was absolutely going to kill me until I got a hold of your teaching and started realizing that I still had a life left. I was abused sexually by my dad for many, many, many years. It was bad. And I was messed up in every way that a person could be messed up. But I'm still here, and I'm still getting better and better every day. But here's something, here's something that has to change if you want to have the promises of God. You have to make a decision, and if you haven't made it yet, it might as well be tonight. And the decision you have to make is you're no longer going to have a victim mentality. Now, I love you with all my heart. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing this. But I want to tell you that you can be pitiful or you can be powerful. But if you're going to sit around with self-pity day after day after day because life hasn't treated you fair, then you are going to miss out on the great things that God has for you. Amen. 
everybody's equal in God. Truly, everybody has equal opportunity in God because he said, here's my promises. If you will believe me, I will do these things. But it doesn't say how long you got to believe. It didn't say five minutes or three minutes or two weeks. You may have to believe for years and years and years and be really steadfast, but you don't have anything better to do. <laughs> I mean, do you? You might as well have some hope. It's not much fun to live without any. I read an interesting story in a book titled Child of the Jungle. A missionary and his family lived among the, the Feiyu tribe in New Guinea. The missionary's daughter, Sabine, wrote this. When we first moved to the Feiyu, we wondered whether they knew any songs since we never heard them singing. This question was answered fairly quickly. We had just returned from Danu Bara. I'm probably just tearing all those names up, but, and our things had once again been stolen. So every time they left, came back, the very people they were trying to minister to had stolen all their stuff. And as we were cataloging our losses, we heard singing from the other side of the river. And it was Nekairi singing in a lovely monotone. Oh, he sang. The Feiyu are like birds. Oh, they always take from the same tree. Oh, <laughs> such bad people. Oh, <laughs> poor Klausu, poor, poor Dorisu. They are so sad and wonder where all their stuff is. Oh. <laughs> Papa was delighted as it became clear to us that the Feiyu simply improvise a song to match their situation. The songs only consist of three notes which, with which they express whatever they are feeling in the moment. It is not the most sophisticated music, but it is a sound I quickly came to love. Their use of songs to express themselves may be one of the reasons, now I want you to listen to this, may be one of the reasons why the Feiyu do not seem to suffer from depression or other psychological disorders. Their feelings are immediately expressed. There are even times set aside for the release of emotions. For example, the mourning song. When the song of mourning runs its course, the grieving truly is finished and life resumes as normal. <laughs> when a person experiences a traumatic event, he might lie for weeks in his hut not saying a word, but yet singing for hours at a time. During this period, other clan members would provide him with food. Then one day, he would simply get up, come out of his tent, leave the trauma behind, cleansed of all the pain. He would smilingly resume his everyday tasks. What if we started making up our own songs? Oh, I am so miserable because my husband lost his job. <laughs> And I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, I don't understand why my friends are blessed and I seem to always have trouble. Oh, oh, when will my circumstances change? I feel like running away from it all. Oh, after hearing me preach this at a seminar, a girl on our staff made up a song about her sinuses. And it went something like this. Oh, I am so tired of my sinuses being stuffed. Oh, I just want to breathe. Yes, I just want to breathe with ease. It doesn't seem fair that I'm allergic to the space I live in. Oh, it just isn't fair. And you know, at first I thought, well, how corny. But you know what? That's exactly what David did in the Psalms. I mean, if you go, they're songs. It says a song from David or a song about this or a song about that. And most of them are just complaining. I don't know. Be a fool for Christ. Try it. Come on, get up on your feet. Give God a big praise.
Well, in order to take hold of the new beginning that God has for you, there's two things that you need to do. Let go of what lies behind and press forward to the things ahead. It's gonna be challenging at times, but remember what the Bible says. You can do anything through Christ who is your strength. When this mother first carried her daughter into the room, our hearts sank and tears immediately sprang to our eyes. It's a far too common sight here in East Africa, children suffering from malnutrition on the verge of starvation. It's difficult to see, but something we can't ignore. We did assessment among um, 8,000 families, and I asked mothers, how many children do you have? Some would say seven, some would say eight, and I say, how many are alive? Half, four, or three. So that was the story of this village. Tell us about this family. Do you remember when you first came in contact with them? Yeah, uh, when they brought Nagash. The Nagash was five months old, and he was very tiny, uh, malnourished in young infant. Not only him, but the, if you see the mother, she was so depressed, uh, significant weight loss, and uh, you don't see any smile on her face. And uh, also the other kids were also underweight. This is real and it's happening every single day. And what they're seeing is not a starving child. They're seeing a child that will not live. That's what you're really seeing. You're seeing a child before it dies, because if we don't help, the child will not survive. Pat Bradley is with Crisis Aid International, the organization that Hand of Hope has been working with in this part of the world for many years. And this new permanent clinic is taking care to a new level offering inpatient treatment for the severely malnourished, providing families with life-saving opportunities that didn't exist before. So we admitted all the, the, all the family and uh, we give him all the care he needs. Big difference when you see him now? Now there is a huge significant difference. He's uh, gaining weight, he's so playful. Now one year old, he's trying to walk and you can see the difference on the, all, the whole family. Well, it's wonderful to see yeah, yeah. what God can do. Were you afraid that you were going to lose your son, that he wouldn't make it? I lost hope. I thought you would die. I, I thought you, I'm going to lose him, but I did a last attempt and brought him to the clinic. I was praying when I came to the clinic. I was praying to God. And when they say to me, yeah, we'll keep him and we'll treat him, I mean, I was, I was so happy. God has heard my prayer. There's no exaggeration. There are tens of thousands of children today who are alive because of Hand of Hope. Isaias is an amazing little man. He became our instant friend and we had such a great time with him. He and many of the kids on this playground are joyful and full of life because you've given them an opportunity to live. God answered many prayers and you provided a way when no way existed. And many more need our loving help. Have you ever wanted to help hurting people, but you feel like you can't make a difference? I want you to know that you can. When we work together, 
We can feed hungry children, rescue women from human trafficking, and help victims of natural disasters. Uh, that's just few of the things that we can do. And I'm asking you, if you're not a partner with our ministry, I'm asking you to partner with us, to become a financial partner with the ministry. And that means that you do something on a regular basis, monthly or, or quarterly, but we need people all over the world helping us so we can keep reaching hurting people. And honestly and truly, what each one of us can do by ourselves is minute compared to what we can do if we put it all together. And so I'm inviting you to join the family today and make an amazing difference all over the world for God's glory. You can be a world changer. You've got what it takes. You are brilliant. You are absolutely amazing. You are created in the image of God. There is so much good stuff in you that you are just about to pop open with goodness. Meer motiverende preken vind je op het Joyce Meyer YouTube kanaal. Bekijk ze maar eens.